Good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, alternatively, because we all need to be inclusive here, and so I need to include your time zone, because I don't want to be a time zonist, I think is the term. In any event, gentlemen, I'm sure you're aware that since the beginning, and since the various phases of feminism, there have always been females that have been opposed to feminism. And the typical female who's opposed to this was the sort of trad con s type, the more quote-unquote traditional girl, maybe religious, maybe not, but in any event appreciated the more traditional values, as it were. And that seems all well and good on the face of it. However, as most of you probably know, the vast majority of these women who did oppose feminism, people like Phyllis Schlafly, who opposed the draft for women in the 1970s, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they weren't doing it because they thought feminism was just a morally bankrupt, corrupt system that ruined the lives of men and women as well, but rather because they saw what they had to lose should feminism progress in its then form or its current form. Take your pick. They're both pretty horrendous. But nonetheless, they weren't doing it to be generous and kind, but rather because they were looking out for their own interests. And let's be honest, that's how most human beings act and deal with things. But the point needs to be made that since its inception, yes, these women have existed. And the reasons why they opposed feminism were always self-serving reasons. Hard to blame them, that's just how human beings are. Now, why I'm bringing this up is because there's been an interesting trend in recent years that has demonstrated that the other political aisle, if you will, has also begun to show various misgivings as in theology. And the difference here, although both forms of opposition are, of course, self-serving, we can talk about that in a bit, is that it was and is a lot easier if you depict yourself as a traditional conservative or religious person to oppose feminism, to say it's bad, to say it's not good for women, to even say it's not good for men, although most of them obviously don't care about men. It's a lot harder if you've been enmeshed and indoctrinated in university life and the various political ideologies that are a dime a dozen at any modern university in the Western world these days. And so there have been a number of people who have come out, authors more broadly, writing books about why what have you, feminism, sex positivism, et cetera, et cetera, these are actually negative and not good for women, even though they come from the more traditionally left-wing perspective and indeed in some cases have been actually been indoctrinated at universities, primarily, as is always the case, because they have recognized that modern feminism is fairly self-serving and probably not helping them out very much. Now, unlike the conservative types, these women who are, quote-unquote, left-wing anti-feminists are more the types that will still endorse some kind of form of feminism, a mild form of it, or a kind of feminism that gives women more options. So they're not opposed to it because of necessarily traditional roles, but rather because they can now see the overt damage it does. And one woman in particular has been very vocal. Her name is Louise Perry. She's recently released a book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And the reality is, and I've only skimmed through it and listened to her talk, so full disclosure, I haven't read her book. When I listen to her and people like her, she's talking about things that people in the manosphere have been talking about for years, if not decades. For example, she'll mention that it wasn't political ideology or necessary legislature that had been passed that really fundamentally changed the game. It was the emergence of human birth control, i.e. birth control for women, that allowed them to gain control over their reproductive rights, et cetera, et cetera, which led to all sorts of fun and not so fun things afterwards. And in specific, she likes to talk about what has happened in the sexual market. And what's always funny is that most men are, of course, invisible. She talks about all these opportunities that are available to men to just screw women left and right, have intercourse with them, and that the women are left standing there without many options. And again, this goes to show just how self-serving all of this is. Very few people, very few women, and I can only think of one, the artist formerly known as Girl Rights What, oppose feminism on the grounds that it is fundamentally unfair 
towards both sexes and has led to destruction and disarray in society. Most of the time, whether left or right or anything in between, opposition comes from the conviction that it is harmful to women. And there's no doubt on some level it is, right? Because the price of sex, even though it's only available to some men, has dropped tremendously. And so the one thing that most men want to get from women is quote-unquote regularly available. Of course, she's excluding the 80% of men or so that don't have it as easily, especially the sub-fives, the really, really unattractive guys. But all this counter-feminism that we've been witnessing, you could say, is now culminating in a kind of pseudo-feminist narrative that nonetheless is worried about the negatives and the drawbacks that have emerged in the 21st century for women. Now, part of this is related to a contingent of the left that is a little bit fed up, how should we put it, with the excesses of the left, namely the woke stuff, the SJW stuff, and just how extreme everything has become. But if women were ever good at anything, it was galvanizing themselves in an effort to, quote-unquote, improve their lot. Now, the interference here, of course, is that it's not always identifiable and clear what it means to improve their lot, because a lot of women back in the day thought feminism would be a great thing, and it turned out to be less than ideal for a lot of them. But I think the major issue when it comes to this is really an issue that a lot of women struggle with, and that's the issue in matter of constraint or self-restraint. There requires a certain discipline to get through life and sometimes you need to forsake things and not engage in certain things to get by. Maybe you have a proclivity towards drinking, for example, and you enjoy alcohol. Okay. Well, you can also recognize that if you indulge that proclivity and even if you enjoy it, that could still be destructive to your life and have a negative effect on various outcomes that you want to achieve in life. So that's an example of how you might be inclined towards something. So yeah, it might be the case, just as an example, that an attractive Becky plus, maybe a 7 or a 7.2 or three, even a 7.5, wants to take full advantage of all the options available to her. She wants to sample all the Chad juice and wants to engage in all kinds of CC riding and wants to have fun and also wants a boyfriend, what have you. And sure, that's taking advantage of the gifts that the gods have given her. But like the guy who recognizes that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be drinking, even if I enjoy it, because it leads to negative outcomes down the line, in theory, she would have to recognize that having a high body count, engaging in these types of activities, will drop her overall rating and long-term prospects, at least to a certain degree. And that whilst it might be, quote-unquote, painful to reduce yourself to a one-man kind of girl, in terms of long-term contentment, or quote-unquote happiness, that possibly is a much better option than taking advantage of the few brief years of youth you have to flit about experiencing various roosters, as it were. And that's something that a lot of women struggle with. A lot of humans in general struggle with it, but women have, as a rule, more options than men as long as they're average-looking, even if they're not average-looking. And so to not take advantage of that, and remember, women are addicted to attention, Attention is their currency, it's their drink, it's their meat, it's what their sustenance is. They get attention for it. So maybe they're not even that into the sex, but they get attention for it. And to resist that and to stay focused on some kind of long-term abstract goal where you find a suitable partner and then found a family, which is what a lot of women want to do, at least to some degree, is a very difficult thing to entertain. And indeed, and the discipline required for it is very difficult as well, because you have to think in terms of addiction. Addiction to attention, addiction to being in the spotlight. It's very difficult to resist, just like any other addiction. So part of this, ultimately, this left-wing contingent that is now opposing feminism and its results, and the general cultural trends, is related to their acknowledgement that a lot of women just are in a position to recognize this, A, B, internalize it, and C, show self-restraint in an effort to better their lives long-term. And as most of you probably know, I've always been of the conviction that should things ever change politically, culturally, et cetera, et cetera, it will only be because women most affected. That's just how the world works, at least in the West. Women most affected, we get changes. Women not most affected, we don't get any changes. That's just how it is. Anyway, as always, thank you for tuning in. Please leave a like, share, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, the bell icon, of course. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. Take care. Have a God's watch over you. Bye-bye.
If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.